So, I was DMing a game for a group of friends, and the party was on a quest from a mad, evil wizard to raid a magic vault for its super power supply so that the necromancer of the party could tinker with it in order to supercharge her necrotic abilities so she could fully revive people. Once they got into the magic vault, they instead talked to the vault owners and were allowed to go in. The necromancer's experiment was something new, and the vault keepers were interested in trying to help. The vault keepers gave the party one rule. Do not listen to any strange voices that try to talk to them. When is listening to strange voices ever a good idea? Star Wars, actually. Oh, and cyberpunk, I guess. And Okay, maybe I just hate the Emperor. <laughs> they enter. The strange voice in question tempted the party, sorcerer, to help free her friends from this crystal they were stuck in. The voice revealed itself to be a devil contract, simply known as the Bliss Contract. The contract said that all it wanted the sorcerer to do was to experience bliss with all of her friends. That sounds like meth! <laughs> Every time the word bliss was stated in the contract, it was always capitalized. The trick was, bliss was the devil's name, and if they asked the vault keepers about it, they would have spilled the beans, but... No one asked, even after the vault keepers told them not to go near that piece of paper under any circumstances. Anyway, the sorcerer accepts her contract, and when she frees her friends, who were being held captive because the crystal they were in was a super potent magic battery the bad guys were harvesting, she freed her friends, but her and her friends got taken by bliss. It was a rather interesting experience, and the only time I've ever killed a player. The contract's rather easy to get out of, they just had to ask questions about the blatantly evil contract. I present to you, my friend, your infernal contract, written in bone, signed in fire, unbreakable to any mortal man. It's, um, uh, it's blank. Oh, uh, yeah, that, that's actually intentional. The terms are only visible to you. Oh, cool, cool. Wait, wait, are you, are you signing it right now? I mean, I mean, yeah, like, I'm, I'm ready to go. Let's get this thing started. I, I just th thought you'd notice, like, that, that little bit. Oh, I kind of just, like, skipped past that part. You know, I skimmed it. Yeah, I, I, I get the point. You just, like, skipped over the whole, you just skipped through the whole thing. I put some really clever stuff. Do, do you not want me to sign it? Dude, I mean, I, I guess. Dude, I, I'm gonna be honest. You seem like a really trustworthy guy. Like, really. I trust you completely, man. Oh, that's, that's really nice. Okay, you can, you can sign right there, yeah. It's, hey, hey, don't cry, it's okay. Everybody needs a loving hand every now and then. Today, I'm that guy for you. <laughs> yep, all signed and done. You're welcome. <laughs> Sometimes we expect too much from our players. Basic use of brain cells might be a bit beyond some of our capabilities. <laughs>wasn't this DM's first time running anything, as he had a few other 5th edition campaigns under his belt, and a few ongoing ones too, but this was the first one I had joined. All seemed relatively normal at first, as he described the setting as a grim dark world where constant monsters were creeping about, cultists were up to no good, and there was more than meets the eye. Transformers, more than meets the eye. Sorry. This all seemed to pique my interest. I promise you the backstory for the character is actually vital to the story. The DM had insisted that we all meet him in a voice call, one-on-one, -on -one, to discuss designing a character that way we'd be interconnected, and he'd write everything down that he'd need. We didn't need to write anything down ourselves, but our character sheets. I went about making a female drow who was abducted from her topside family home in the fields and taken by a mysterious cult. They performed strange blood magic on her which made her a rune child sorcerer, and there were hints that they were trying to make her a vessel for an old god or a monstrosity. It made my girl completely terrified of all magic, including her own, which is massively important for later. I worked alongside the DM for a lot of this backstory. He added an NPC, who was also a kidnapped child turned monster, who helped my drow escape by attacking the cultists. Skipping over a few things, she fled to a major city and became a street rat, Rogue, who survived on scraps. One of the first issues came when the DM decided to really forcefully fit in an NPC who was like an older, grizzled soldier of a church into my backstory. 
by the time my character would have met him, she would have been an adult due to how elves and drought age, or at the very least a late teenager. But the DM kept trying to say that this NPC was like a pseudo father figure my character had met as a young child. Fed her and tried to take her in, but my character was just too paranoid to accept. Uh, Timeline wise. It never really made a lot of sense, and the other players got heavily confused by it, but for the sake of just keeping the peace, I let it slide. I will be your parent, small, helpless child. Bro, I'm like 30 years old. What are you talking about? I stated multiple times that my character did not view him as a father figure since her actual dad is still very much alive, and one day she wants to try and find him. More on this later. We didn't have a session zero per se, but he told us the themes and we all agreed to be down. I'll let it pass. <laughs> he gave us a list of <sighs> options of starting points we could all have, and we all agreed that meeting on the road would be interesting. It's a grim dark fantasy world after all, and strength is in numbers when traveling. Instead, he decided to ignore the choice everyone had made without telling us until the first session, and instead, we were all going to be in an autumn festival? Think like, hay bales, candied apples, mechanical bull? For more than half the party, this made no sense. We were all tragic, traumatized characters who were venturing into a grim dark world because of very serious objectives, so it took us by surprise. <laughs> Expectation. Reality. Me especially, since my character was forced into attending this festival by her undesired pseudo-dad figure saying she needed a vacation, and he hired a bodyguard, one of the other players, to protect her. Now this could have worked really well if the DM had told the player of that character of my character's debilitating issues with magic, but I guess he just like never brought it up. Or the fact that my character could protect herself well enough due to her rogue levels. We always thought this was just a secret the DM was keeping because I wanted my character to be paranoid and shifty about who knew. After really jarring festival shenanigans that half our characters half hardly participated in, the session continued on with the twist being that this whole festival was orchestrated by strange forces trying to lure out townsfolk and capture them. Honestly? Really cool twist. I'm sure the DM is gonna mess it up, but still, let me give a compliment, okay? It was at this point that all the players started separately realizing that the DM was not mentioning key things about their character backstories either. Like, one character was supposed to have a lantern that could detect Fey, or another would have had an important NPC because they were connected to the people that nuked their country with a magic bomb. Yeah, you heard that, right? It was like Agent Orange nuke that infected citizens with magic decay, among a bunch of other things. And my character, the whole cult trauma thing, was supposed to give me more insights or understanding about culty things in the world, yet never came up with this weird cult organized festival. There weren't anything that my character saw as signs or anything suspicious. All of the players started talking individually about the fact that so many things were being neglected, or we'd have to mention it in character about how we'd know something about XYZ because of our backstory. After four sessions of this, and players constantly prodding the DM about how certain things weren't adding up for certain player characters, the DM finally admitted that he had lost all his notes on our backstory. The reason? Because he had written it all down on a napkin on his desk that he later used and threw out. Bro, use your backstories to wipe his nose? Hey, Tolkien, how's the masterpiece going? Oh, yes, I am very much deep into revisions at this time. <sighs> you know, working really hard on it. Okay. Anyway, yeah. Because of that, he lost all his notes, and he wasn't ever going to tell us this until we kept pushing him on it. So, we all had to remind him of our backstories. He quickly overcompensated by giving our characters an ability related to our backstories, and we tried to continue on, though a lot of us were soured by this, especially as our backstories would have helped with the interconnectivity of the party, which we sorely lacked. The campaign didn't last much longer beyond that. We had hitched a ride back from the festival to the major city, told the pseudo-dad figure about the cult organizing the festival after we took care of it, and we went about visiting a gambling smexy time den for celebration. The DM pushed us to go there too. Then, while we were enjoying the baths there, there was a plot twist that we'd never actually left the town. The festival was... Yep, we had this whole it was all a dream moment. 
because a hag had put us into a magical sleep, was making straw dolls of us to replace us, and we were slowly coming to. Issue was, we had both a drow and a high elf in the party, and we can't be put to sleep thanks to Fey Ancestry, bro. Oh, DM's forgetting oh, that is funny every time, man. They try me every time. My drow was also incredibly paranoid about going into a trance without watch, so she and the high elf actually alternated watches, with my drow hiding up in the rafters of places to keep a good lookout. And now, having a spidey sense of magic, thanks the DM overcorrecting his mistake from before. We brought this up with the DM immediately, because it just wouldn't make any sense. Was it a poison? My drow didn't eat or drink anything from the festival because she didn't trust people. Was it all just magical hallucinations? Two different characters would be able to tell. How was a hag here the whole time and we didn't know? Someone had a lantern that detected the Fey. The DM kind of floundered a bit and just gave us like a trust me bro sort of response on saying the sleep wasn't magical and a few other half-hearted explanations. The campaign ended after that last reveal because the players just weren't really interested in proceeding. We think this whole attempt at the this was all a dream thing was to cover up his major mistakes in forgetting everyone's backstories and also the start that no one really wanted. Mistakes happened, but it was the really defensive and flighty way he went about it that just killed this for all of us. Look, I get it. Balancing situations around every player character ability can be really, really hard. And I think there are times where suspension of disbelief might help the DM a little bit, but here, I mean, the DM is blatantly ignoring core parts of the characters, including things that he gave them. I mean, having a magical lantern that detects the Fae, that's not something that most characters will have at level 1, but the DM purposefully gave that to a player character. Having Spidey Sense with all magic, that was the DM's choice as well. Now, I don't know if the DM actually wrote it all down in a napkin. That seems like a half-hearted lie just to get the party off his back, but... I mean, if it's true, good frickin' lord, please don't do that. Write things down on a Google Doc, I mean, that seems so obvious. And if you lose the player character backstory somehow or forget details, just ask the players! They were clearly capable of recounting their backstories to the DM, they did it in this story. Look, I don't think every player character backstory needs to immediately tie into the first session. I mean, not even Matt Mercer does that, but it's blatantly ignoring them. That's what completely breaks the illusion of the game. First, I wanted to give a big thank you for continuing the content. It's great stuff to listen to while I'm working, working on my own session, just procrastinating in between. Thank you, by the way. But I have a rather entertaining story for you. One I didn't experience personally, I was more of an audience to this, but I figured this would get a chuckle out of you and your audience as it did for me. Allow me to paint you a picture. It's another typical late night in a local game shop. Rather empty save for one rustic wood table designed for your standard TTRPG game. At that table, there were a few of the typical Joes, to put simply, with your standard accruement for a Dungeon and Dragon session. A character sheet for each Joe, multiple sets of dice, pens, and paper, and the iconic Dungeon Master screen featured an equally iconic Red Dragon. Four players and one Dungeon Master. <laughs> Side note, I love how a lot of RPG horror stories have long lists of characters and casts. And this guy's just like, Joe. <laughs> I love it. It was a late night, and I finally had a moment to do some early holiday shopping for my significant other. I was browsing around, trying to find the perfect set of dice for my dice goblin, which, if we're getting down to it, she's more like a dice dragon considering her hoard, but I digress. I'm there for longer than I thought I would be. I just couldn't find the right set of dice. I promise this isn't an ad read for dice, but it would be pretty funny if you happen to have a dice sponsor. I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't have a sponsor for this video. I was looking for some sandstone dice as my significant other had been needing one, because after rolling three nat ones in a row, you deserve to remain dice trail. When all of a sudden, BOOM! Yes! I'm not normally one to startle easily. I play horror games in the middle of the night with the lights off and headphones on, but this was enough to make me jump. I look over and see one of the Joes on his feet. His hands were firmly planted upon the table. So as you can imagine, I was morbidly curious. I sauntered. <laughs> Nice word choice. Over to the section of the store to look like I was window shopping, but I was really eavesdropping. What? DM Joe looked equally startled as I did. 
Who says a legendary creature can't have that many legendary resistances? Well, show me a legendary creature that has that many resistances. I don't have to show you crap. Furious Joe continued his rant whilst Phone Joe was on his phone and Nacho Joe was eating his nachos watching this play out. I don't actually like Nacho. It was quite the back and forth between the two. And honestly, I feel like if I went into detail about the absent language, then the story alone would get you demonetized. In fact, even the store owner agreed. But to summarize, Furious Joe was berating DM Joe of cheating, whilst Phone Joe and Nacho Joe sat there as if nothing was happening. It was just like a Tuesday for them. Hey, watch your language. This is a family game. Store Joe said, and was flat, uninterested mod. Oh, sorry. Watch your language. This is a family game store. Store Joe said, in the most flat, uninterested monotone voice you could imagine. Which is even crazier, considering that aside from the Joes and myself, there wasn't anyone else in the store to even hear this fight. They continued to argue, and I went to look around for more D&D stuff. At this point, I'm just wasting time. I have a miniature in my hand, debating on just getting something for nothing, when I noticed that the Joes were vigorously packing up their things. I guess they won't be finishing their encounter. While I went up to store Joe to buy my figure, the other Joes continued to toss around a few F-bombs back at each other, albeit much quieter. Furious Joe flung his, what I assumed to be, a character sheet towards DM Joe and stormed off while the DM continued to pack his things. Phone Joe left with Nacho Joe and honestly, I didn't envy them. However, the night wasn't over. I noticed that Furious Joe got in line shortly after I was done with my transaction. Looks like he wanted to buy something too. But as I was about to leave, DM Joe got in line right behind Furious Joe. It was like Goku and Vegeta squaring off. I have no idea who those people are. But the footage will go here. <laughs> you could practically see the sparks clashing against each other. Well, now I couldn't leave. I had to finish this final scene. I sauntered... <laughs> Seriously, it's a great word choice. Sauntered over to some board games and continued to watch with bated breath. There was an awkward silence. It was so quiet you could hear an ant sneeze. Furious Joe was rung up, and before he left, he turned to DM Joe with such a furrowed brow that his forehead looked like a bunch of hot dogs lined up. He curled his lips, grit his teeth, and puffed up his chest. I was ready for another burst of anger. Same time next week, Furious Joe said calmly. <laughs> <laughs> Same time next week? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, we still good? DM Joe said also calmly. Yep, cool. Furious Joe left after that and DM Joe bought something and then left too. I blinked a few times trying to process my brain cells as to make sense of what just transpired. It'll happen again next week, store Joe told me with the same unsurprised tone as before. Moral of the story is... I don't think there is one, but I had to share this as it was a plot twist I wasn't expecting. Ah, I don't know anything about these guys and their friendship, but it doesn't sound great to me. Fighting with your friend over and over again is not exactly the key to a positive relationship or a healthy social life. I feel like a lot of people do get stuck into those kind of friendships though. It might be because of some sunk cost fallacy or some other big words phenomenon that I'm too stupid to understand, but I do think it's unfortunate. I don't think you should drop your friends after just one fight or anything like that, but as a guy who rarely, if ever, fights with his friends, I just can't imagine having a friend that is constantly butting heads with me all the time. And I'm not just talking about friendly ripping, I'm talking about legit screaming matches. That's what this seems like, and that doesn't seem very healthy, but at the end of the day, it's their friendship, it's their choice, their lives. They can do their thing, for better or for worse. At the very least, they had decency not to do it with a lot of other people around, so that's nice. Hey Crispy, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to read this. Where it's not so much a horror story, it is a story about feeling constantly disrespected. Which sounds like a horror story to me, I don't really know what you're talking about. For context, I am an artist who used to actively take adult commissions as my career. I no longer do commissioned artwork, but it was more for financial reasons than emotional ones. However, I feel this greatly affected my D&D group of five years, particularly one other player who I refer to as Wizard, that is what he played for the large majority of the games. I often make crude adult jokes amongst my friends, not directly towards anyone, but as something we all like to joke about. However, I behave very differently at the table when we're playing. 
we're all adults in our late 20s to mid 30s, and while we are pretty open to the occasional adult joke or scenario, we have a strict fade to black rule as it's extremely uncomfortable to play with anything like that at our table. When I'm playing, I'm typically there for adventure. I hardly flirt with NPCs or other players. Dude has no time for bitches. Drag it to the like, Even when I am flirting, it's extremely tame. But this is where the problem comes in. Despite player characters that don't strive for anything intimate, a lot of my fellow players will constantly joke that I'm trying to hook up with whatever NPC I'm talking to, despite having never hooked up to any NPC I've ever talked to in any of the games I've played with this group for five years. This was especially egregious with Wizard. In one campaign, we saved a 16-year-old girl who had an ancient magical power that she had little control over from a lab. While we escorted her to a city she said her family was from, my character spent his time on the road, teaching her how to fight with a sword so that she could defend herself in case they got attacked or someone tried to kidnap her again. Wizard proceeded to accuse me of grooming an underage girl, and I was beyond disgusted. Ah, like Joel from The Last of Us. Famously a groomer. He would laugh about it, saying I was trying to model her into my own personal toy. This made me physically ill. I snapped back at him, asking how anything I had done came off as predatory, in which he came back, saying he was just joking around. I'd probably drawn stuff worse than that. Where I do draw adult content, it's pretty vanilla by most adult art standards, and it certainly doesn't include underage characters. In another campaign, my character was taken in by a family after he lost his mother to a murderous cult. The family had a daughter who was basically like a little sister to my character. Well, this family had knowledge that said the cult's rituals led to them being killed, with the exception of the daughter. My character sought revenge, but one of his primary focuses was making sure his adopted sister had somewhere safe to stay so she wouldn't be attacked by the cult. The whole campaign, Wizard kept trying to insinuate that I was trying to hook up with my little sister, which again made me livid. Bro, how is this now a horror story? Kill wizard already! Those were the worst of the scenarios, but these were consistent accusations of me trying to hook up with any and everyone, and it honestly upset me. I was doing everything I could to be respectful towards my group and not do anything that would make anyone uncomfortable by basically playing characters who were borderline ace, and yet I was still consistently accused of things I wasn't even trying to do. I did talk to my DM about it and about how it upset me, and his concern was more with confronting Wizard about it, since he was such a longtime friend. I did pull Wizard aside and talk to him about how it made me upset, which he did apologize for, and he was just trying to do some playful jabbing. I told him I don't mind a playful jab here and there, but it was getting over the top, and some of the jabs were extremely inappropriate. He understood and dialed it back a great deal. Dude, I playfully jab with my D&D group too, but our playful jabs are like, Hey Kaden, look at this goblin with a penis. Not, Hey Kaden, you're a child predator. It was just upsetting for me as a player because it felt like my group was taking one aspect of my life and made out like it was my entire personality. The group had since fallen apart due to all of us moving to different parts of the country and our DM not wanting to run an online game. I do still play with my wife and some of our friends though, and it's nice to be in a group where I'm not constantly treated like some kind of degenerate. Look, I make a lot of jokes about sex and making fun of you sex havers out there, but at the core of it, I obviously don't have a problem with sex. Sex is a part of life! And furthermore than that, adult art based around sex? That's a part of life as well. And you know what? The people who make that deserve respect just like any other person. That should come as a no-brainer, but for some people, they just can't wrap their heads around it. This isn't a jab. I mean, this is something that's happening in almost every session, constantly, over five years. That's different. That's targeted. Shaming someone like this just makes them feel awful. It's basic decency not to do that. That's a wrap! If you guys enjoyed, then you might enjoy our last episode of RPG Horror Stories, where we talked about a guy who really wanted to bone a sheep for some reason. It's linked up in the cards, but before you go, please do leave a like on this one and subscribe to Crispy's Tavern so you don't miss any of our content as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, you can go down in the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment Lost Napkin to let me know at the end of the video. Hey, by the way, if you have your own horror stories, you can send them directly to us. There's an email down in the description down below. 
send your stories our way for a chance to be featured in one of these videos. But hey, even if you don't have any stories, then essence like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you all next time. Farewell. I didn't actually blow my nose into this. This is a second edition copy. I'm not a savage.